classification of a company's workers as employees or as independent contractors continues to be viewed as a widespread issue. Just about everyone knows that the IRS, along with most taxing and regulatory agencies, does not favor independent contractor treatment. These agencies believe, sometimes correctly, that the independent contractor classification is subject to abuse. In fact, the service is inclined to presume that most workers should be classified as employees, even if they may actually be called independent contractors. And that makes sense. After all, a person who is paid as an independent contractor does not pay his or her taxes until the filing deadline the following year. In contrast, payments to employees are subject to Social Security and Medicare taxes, which are collected on wages immediately. In a similar vein, self-employment taxes paid by independent contractors have been one of the most notoriously undercollected taxes. As a result, there are both timing and revenue differences between employee and independent contractor treatment. Now, these lead to a great preference by the IRS as well as by state regulators in the area of unemployment compensation and workers' compensation, in treating all workers as employees and subjecting them to withholding. In an era when the front page headlines are preoccupied with health care reform and immigration reform, we asked Rebecca Saran to find out why Robert Wood, our longtime expert commentator on independent contractor compliance and misclassification, calls this issue the elephant in the room. Joining us is Robert W. Wood, who practices law with the firm of Wood LLP in San Francisco and is the author of Legal Guide to Independent Contractor Status, now in its fifth edition. Thanks for being with us once again, Rob. Nice to be here. Thanks, Becky. Last year you told me, Rob, that the issue of classifying workers as employees or independent contractors was becoming more pivotal than ever for businesses. So let me ask you, how accurate was your crystal ball? To what extent is worker classification still a front burner issue for businesses and their tax advisors? I, I wish my crystal ball were more accurate. I mean, I, th I think it's been partially true. It, it sh certainly should be a front burner issue. Um, I, I don't know for many people if it is. I think very frequently what happens is the companies are so um, interested in growing their revenue and sort of pushing out new products and, and new services that they don't revisit these kinds of fundamental issues until some something happens that makes them do it. It might be a lawsuit. Uh, uh, or, or something else in go a government investigation, but uh, it certainly ought to be an important topic. Well, when we covered the onset of Obamacare, you mentioned to me that the federal statute defined full-time employees as those who worked, on average, 30 or more hours per week. Well, I'm curious, has that guideline had an impact on workplace practices besides health care benefits? I think so. I mean, uh, everyone knows that whether it's uh, providing health coverage under Obamacare or, uh, or simply the usual tax withholdings, that it's, it's more expensive to have employees. Uh, you have all the non-discrimination laws, uh, typically state and federal. Uh, so, there, I mean, there are a whole bunch of uh, reasons that it's cheaper to have independent contractors, provided that the status uh, holds up. Um, but you mentioned uh, Obamacare, health coverage, yes. Uh, it is true that uh, some companies are uh, pushing the envelope trying to avoid having employees uh, that, they will, that they will have to cover under the health care rules. A few years ago, Rob, you indicated that the trend toward new forms of worker classification was driven by the economy. After all, at the time, a lot of businesses wanted to ride the recovery by hiring so-called temporary workers. But these days, it seems as if the latest trend involving the issue is driven as much by technology as by the economy, doesn't it? Yeah, ab absolutely. I, I, uh, I think the technology, which uh, I admit uh, I'm not uh, <laughs> all that savvy about, uh, but we all know that there are these uh, companies that are using um, enormous sort of branding power that they have and providing a service or a product sort of to everyone in a in a large geographic area of the country the world um, and so yes a lot of that is taking place and, and further pushing the envelope with a worker status well on one hand we've got an entire alphabet soup of federal and state agencies that regulate and audit a businesses arrangements for tax withholding health care, pension, and unemployment insurance. 
But on the other hand, it seems as if we're also seeing a lot of issues, including class action lawsuits triggered by workers who signed contracts as independent contractors, now claiming that they are employees, aren't we? The way you ask the question raises a fundamental point, which is who gets to decide? I think a lot of employers, uh, sophisticated and, and less so, uh, are surprised when they find that they can have a contract that is signed in ink, possibly even signed in blood, and that it can be recharacterized. That is, a worker who says, I agree I'm not an employee, I agree I'm an independent contractor, I agree I'm not going to come after you, Mr. Employer, for, uh, for any kind of worker uh, benefits, no health, no nothing. I know you're not withholding, I'm going to pay my own taxes. And sort of all these commitments, sort of anything that you want this person to say, and they sign it and they you know, have their wits about them, they have uh, contracting capacity, they might even have a lawyer that looks at, uh, at such an agreement for them. And the courts have said, and the, the taxing agencies like the IRS or the Department of Labor uh, in, you know, and other non-tax concepts too, that that contract does not necessarily mean that the worker is not really an employee. If you um, have a company uh, or work for a company that is facing one of these types of lawsuits, I mean, the range of liabilities is, is, is staggering. Um, and of course, it can go back a number of years. I think for a lot of employers, that they, they sort of shake their head and, and think, how is this possible? But it is, it is certainly possible. Thanks, Rob. We'll return to your commentary in a minute. This spring has been a tough season for ride-sharing startups Uber and Lyft. Two federal court judges in California issued separate decisions this spring in class action lawsuits brought by drivers of both companies. The drivers are alleging that Uber and Lyft misclassified them as independent contractors, thereby depriving the drivers of many employee rights and benefits. Both Uber and Lyft have filed motions with the federal courts seeking summary judgment on the grounds that they had properly classified the drivers as independent contractors. The courts in both cases denied their motions, ruling that juries would have to decide in each case whether or not the drivers are employees. But what impact will these cases have for companies that use a 1099 business model, particularly in the so-called on-demand economy? The current court actions involve Uber and Lyft, but I suppose it's logical for businesses in an on-demand economy to consider these workers as independent contractors. I mean, the workers can make themselves available for work whenever they want and can accept or reject rides whenever they want, can't they, Rob? Yeah, I, I was waiting for you to mention, <laughs> mention those two companies. Uh, they have very much been in the news, uh, and not just uh, national or local news, but really worldwide news. Um, because they've really shaken up an entire industry, the industry of taxi cabs and, and uh, you know, now so-called ride sharing. So, and those are, those are distinctly uh, technology companies, if you listen to what the companies say. Um, and there are lots of uh, drivers, some who, it, it may be unfair to pigeonhole all of them in one category, but some who work for different companies, uh, for example, who might drive for uh, Uber and Lyft uh, both, uh, some who work very little, and some who work a decidedly full-time occupation. So um, and there the are variety of liabilities, uh, not just tax liabilities, um, but, uh, but it's a really interesting area. And yes, I think those class actions are as I understand it, proceeding. But I should probably mention that some of these cases, I think one in particular involving Uber, uh, is simply a wrongful death case. I, I don't know if simply is the right word, but it is a wrongful death case. So in other words, it's not an employee class action or worker class action. It is simply a regular old case, and there have been a lot of these uh, impacting taxi cabs and and other types of uh, delivery services, delivery of people, delivery of goods, uh, where somebody gets ki you know, injured seriously or killed, um, and then the question is, who is liable? And obviously, the driver is liable, um, and anybody else who may have caused the accident. But I think the, a key question here is, um, tort liability under uh, the Latin term respondeat superior, which is an agency concept. 
So we all know that if a, uh, a UPS driver uh, who's an employee drives over someone and injures or kills them, uh, the driver is liable, but so is UPS. And so in the, in the case of Uber and many of these other kinds of uh, services, uh, the question is what's going to happen? And I think the, the jury is still out on that case and in many cases like it. And those things, oddly enough, may end up driving much, no pun intended, much of the debate on the worker status cases. Because it, it, it's sort of a different legal concept, but I think it's relevant and worth watching. Well, as you say, there may be some ways that a worker is like an employee and other ways that the same worker is like an independent contractor. So how does a court decide if the business is passing or failing the key test? Do you have the right to control the manner and means of accomplishing the desired result? Well, the, the traditional answer is uh, facts and circumstances. And I think for, for lawyers uh, and accountants, and certainly for business people, that's a very frustrating uh, kind of thing to confront. I mean, what we all want, I, I guess, what clients want is, is sort of clear answers. And when some uh, one, either an individual or a company that has hundreds or thousands uh, or hundreds of thousands of workers, um, sits down with an advisor and says, okay, what are these people, th this particular category? Not necessarily every single worker, but this type of a salesperson, for example. What, what is this person? Um, and it would be really nice to have some, some a litmus tests. Unfortunately, we don't have that. The IRS still uses the 20 factors. More recently, the last few years, they have another sort of reduced number of, of uh, seven factors. It's essentially the same test. Most of the states have a kind of knockoff of that uh, where they look at uh, the words you used, uh, Becky, uh, uh, controlling the manner and mean, method, manner and means, the three M's, if you will. Uh, but it isn't easy. And uh, very frequently, as you might expect, if you ask the government, they're going to opt in favor of employee status because if it's the IRS, because they get the money right away via withholding. They get much more money that way because it's earlier and it's more reliable than uh, independent contractors filling out a Schedule C tax return and sending it in. And I think it's true for most other agencies too, that is uh, workers' comp authorities and uh, labor departments and uh, industrial relations departments around the country. All of them want and need money and they get that much more regularly from employees. I think one key fact about any of these facts and circumstances discussions uh, is, is simply that uh, it's, it's un, th there is no litmus test. So if you have three factors out of 20 or seven factors out of 20, that doesn't mean you're safe and it doesn't mean that you're not safe. Uh, m much depends on which factor may be the most important uh, on your particular facts and what is most likely uh, in a juror's mind or the court's mind to, to weigh particularly in favor of employee status. So um, it's very hard. I think it's one reason why uh, some of the work that I've done as an expert witness is, is not so much to say, which, say this is what the result should be because that really is the ultimate issue in the case but rather these are the kinds of methodologies that one uses and these are the kinds of factors, let's say in the, the IRS 20 factors, which is a basic, basically a common law test, these are the factors that probably don't matter uh, on, a, on a given set of facts because they're almost always going to cut one way or the other. They're, uh, they, they sometimes are a kind of a 50-50 issue, right to terminate the person, right to quit which are, the, they're often reciprocal rights. The worker has a right to quit, the company has a right to terminate. If you have both of those things present, as you, as you often do, they really shouldn't matter too much. They should cancel each other out. That's the kind of thing that I think helps judges and juries sort out these things. Well, both of these actions are in your neighborhood, Rob, the Northern District of California. Is it telling that the courts denied summary judgment in both cases? It is significant. Uh, I think the court sent a big mes message by denying summary judgment, saying this is not a legal issue. 
uh, that it has to be based on the facts. And so uh, somebody, and that could be a judge or it could be a jury, I think a jury frightens big companies typically in most uh, cases like this uh, because they are going to look at it and say, well, really, what are these people? Uh, facts and circumstances analysis, some facts are going to cut one way, some facts are going to cut the other way, and that's going to encourage potentially inconsistent decisions but uh, they could be expensive decisions. In another ongoing court battle in California, Macy's West Stores Incorporated, along with the department store's logistics management company, Joseph Elito Transfer Incorporated, have agreed to pay $4 million to settle a class action misclassification lawsuit brought by over 600 truck drivers and their helpers. Of that amount, Macy's agreed to pay $3 million, and the logistics company will pay $1 million in settlement of the claims by the workers. According to the drivers and helpers, the department store and its delivery company misclassified them as independent contractors in violation of the California Labor Code. According to the plaintiffs, although the drivers signed independent contractor agreements with the logistics management company, the relationship was heavily regulated by the department store. Specifically, they alleged that the drivers and helpers were required, one, to display the Macy's logo on their trucks, two, to wear Macy's uniforms, three, to follow Macy's delivery schedules, four, to leave their trucks at Macy's sites at the end of the day, and five, to be evaluated on whether they met Macy's standards and expectations of delivery and customer service. Okay, so Mike just gave us the facts of the settlement of the class action misclassification case against the Macy's West department store. Maybe the drivers and helpers were employees and maybe they were independent contractors. I certainly don't know. But here's what I really don't understand. If the truckers had signed independent contractor agreements with the logistics management company, how could the department store be liable? Well, you, 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 Becky, you sound like uh, a lot of employers with whom I sympathize that say that very thing. Hey, wait a minute, how can these people sue me? Because they signed it, they understood it. In fact, in some cases, it's, it's not, uh, I guess you could say, an adhesion contract. It's, it's something where the workers, and this is, I've seen this, actually say, this is what we want to be. We want to do all these things ourselves. We want to decide if we're going to have three trucks or one truck. Um, we want to be able to hire helpers and so on. So it's not a one-way street, but um, it's, it's uh, that, that kind of a case where you have an employer uh, whether whether Macy's uh, West uh, had a good case or not a good case, it made, I gather, what is a financial decision to say uh, $4 million or whatever the, the payment was is less than the potential exposure. It's better to buy safety and certainty and, and sort of get rid of it now. But if, Becky, if you're asking, does it sort of stick in a company's craw when they are paying something and they think they have a bulletproof contract, yeah, it, it typically does. But, but once again, neither with a, a civil plaintiff or a, a, a single person or a class action, nor with a government agency, is that document sort of the be all and end all. It's still going to be um, this murky facts and circumstances test, which is why I think it's so hard for advisors to give advice on these, these issues. An important point, um, uh, Becky, about that Macy's case, and indeed I think it is an emerging trend here that one could say might be even harder for some companies to understand, uh, is that the contract may be not with the, uh, the sort of nominal employer, if you will. So in this case, Macy's, as I understand it, contracted with a third-party trekking company. The third-party trekking company then hired independent drivers. And so how does Macy's end up getting roped into this dispute and end up paying a lot of money, you might ask. It is not unlike uh, a franchise, a franchisor franchisee arrangement where uh, you often have uh, a, a complete, for, for example, I think Domino's a pizza delivery uh, cases, there have been some of those uh, that raise this same kind of issue. Um, and, and of course, a, a good lawyer sues everybody who is uh, in, in the room uh, who may be involved, and then it's up to the various defendants to sort out 
how they um, per sort of parcel their liability. But it, it isn't clear that you have to have a, uh, a direct um, independent contract relationship with a worker to be able to, to, to be sued. But I think there, too, in healthcare, one sees these kind of tripartite arrangements where you have a doctor going to a hospital, and the hospital may well say, we don't hire doctors, quote unquote, but if you have your own medical corporation, then we can enter into a service agreement and a participation agreement or whatever they may call it with the doctor's company, the doctor's company or his professional corporation then enters into an agreement with a hospital. If there is malpractice, sort of everyone gets sued and one of the key issues oftentimes is going to be uh, worker status of the doctor, even though there are these sort of layers of legal relationships. So it's, it's a complex and I think emergingly even more complex arrangement as we, uh, as we go forward. A few years ago, Rob, you mentioned that the IRS and the Labor Department were now sharing information as well as acting in concert with state regulators. Is it possible that these businesses and others who use similar workplace arrangements are going to face scrutiny from more taxing and regulatory authorities? It is possible. Uh, I think it's more than possible. It is happening. But uh, I think like uh, everything else in, in government, um, it, it tends to move slowly. So it, it isn't as though um, sort of there's been a sea change overnight. But I think there is more of that information is being exchanged. And I think that one domino often leads to another domino falling. I think some people on the plaintiff's side of these cases uh, actually try to bring in the government uh, and try to interest the government in pursuing uh, a particular industry. In the food industry, uh, there have been a lot of cases, uh, as well as uh, other types of truck use. Package delivery uh, business, of course, impacting uh, FedEx and companies of that ilk. Um, but I, I think it's not a foregone conclusion that there will be an investigation or sort of an industry-wide query, but uh, it, it does happen, and it, probably more of it will happen in the future. Well, think about our viewers, Rob. After all, they're your clients, and they say that a company had a salesperson in a faraway state. He or she was treated as an independent contractor, and now that worker has filed a complaint with his or her state's unemployment agency or their worker compensation board. Doesn't it make sense to just pay the $86 fine rather than contesting the reclassification? I, th I think the way you asked the question, uh, Becky, and uh, the small magnitude of the fine, the answer is, is, of course, it makes sense. Obviously, the more latent liability is whether that uh, act of simply giving up and paying the $86 could be viewed as an admission uh, later in some other proceeding. Um, so I, I think the classic answer that a lawyer gives is that is is not to not to pay the fine, or at least if you're going to pay the fine, to make sure that you do it while making your record that the only reason you're paying it is not because this person is actually an employee, but because it's uh, you know your lawyer is going to charge you five hundred dollars an hour or whatever it is, and it's going to cost more um, you know to write a one-page letter than it is to pay the fine. So. And, and I, I think you can do that in a way that preserves your rights, but I think that's the tension in this, in this area. Well, as accountants and financial professionals, our viewers are accustomed to hearing and receiving incentives from the government, quote, we'll go easy on you if you come forward to us and reclassify your workers as employees, end quote. To what extent is the IRS still promoting the idea of a so-called voluntary classification settlement program? Well, they're still doing it. Um, I believe uh, that the, the government response, uh, or I, I should say the taxpayer uh, sort of company response to the government program, the Voluntary Classification Settlement Program, has not been overwhelming. Um, I just know from my own, in my own personal practice, I've seen uh, very little of it. Um, I've seen a few clients who are interested and then who um, get cold feet and don't do it. Um, and I think that experience is probably similar for, for many people. So I, I think it is of interest and the IRS hasn't shut it down. It's still available. 
There was a brief time, I think in 2013, where the IRS uh, sort of goosed the program and offered some special benefits uh, for a limited window. I don't think that was, uh, I don't think that resulted in you know, huge volumes of uh, sort of a big uptick in, in interest. I would say it's very different from a program like the offshore um, overseas offshore volunteer disclosure program that the IRS has for for foreign account matters where there have been um, huge numbers of people that have come in and, and done that. I think this particular worker status one um, has, has been modestly successful and most people, most companies still, in my experience, don't want to do it. The, uh, the government program uh, is very um, uh, much designed to get uh, employers to start doing what the government views as doing it right, that is treating people as employees, sort of whenever in doubt treat people as employees, or I, I don't think it's an, an overstatement to say the government, the IRS at least, would really like it if everyone was an employee. So. So do that prospectively, and then you're withholding, you're paying tax right away, and you're paying employment tax. Now, everything is uh, sort of hunky-dory, if anyone uses that expression anymore, Becky. Now, that may make sense, Rob, in terms of a business's current workforce. But as an attorney, you can tell me, don't companies also need to consider their former workers? I mean, reaching a settlement agreement with the government is not binding on your former independent contractors, is it? But I think the there is concern, and I have seen employers express it, that if we start treating everybody tomorrow as an employee, won't Joe or Bob or Ted, those people that are kind of disgruntled, um, that are still working for me or that no longer work for me, won't they come back and say, hey, wait a minute, you know, give me something too? So. It is, a, it is a slippery slope, and even though you have a, if you're an employer and you have a contract that the worker has signed saying they're going to pay their own taxes, once you, once you realize that that can be abrogated, it's, it's scary. So yeah, absolutely, you're right. Um, if you don't have protection sort of against everybody, the government entities and the, the workers, um, you may come up short and you may have to pay more money. Well, the good news is that as the economy continues to expand, many businesses are growing and they are starting to bring new workers on board. Is there anything that they should do now to avoid trouble later? I think so. Uh, we've, uh, we, you've probably asked me this before, Becky, and I've probably answered um, uh, in much the same way uh, in the past, which is uh, look at your agreements and be realistic. Um, and I think you mentioned the kind of a go-go economy where people are, are being hired, companies are expanding. You mentioned companies like Uber and Lyft, and there are many others that, that are, um, see themselves as primarily technology companies but need a lot of bodies to do the work. And, and, and it may be that a lot of those companies can, and we know that they do, uh, use independent contractors. Um, but I think it, it, it always shocks me when I, uh, I shouldn't say always, it does shock me when I see it, and it's not infrequently when I see it, that companies sort of open up their books to somebody, whether an outside advisor or the government or, or both, and, and things are, are sort of sloppy. And, and, and so you'd, you'd think companies that, uh, that have a big valuation and that are growing and that are making, making money you'd think that they would look at an issue like this, which is uh, potentially, I don't know, a make or break kind of issue, um, it seems to me, uh, if you look at all the potential dollar ramifications, and that they would do some kind of preventative uh, maintenance. Uh, and, and so I think the biggest message I could give on this point would be, Yes, um, it's great that people are being hired. It's great that there is uh, an expanding economy, but don't let it go to your head. Take a look at your facts, at your documents, and think about how you would respond if somebody said, uh, give me all your documents about your workers. Give me all your contracts. Give me your, uh, your manuals. Let me look at their files. You know, what do you call their files? Let us see what it is that you're doing and how you're doing it. 
uh, so that we can examine whether you have a good case or a weak case. Well, it's not just the contract and the tax forms, is it, Rob? Now, one of my sons applied for a temporary position with a big company, and he was told what they needed for his so-called employee file. Yeah, that's, I mean, I think, Becky, the, that's the, an issue I would call a nomenclature. Um, and th there's nothing, uh, I, think, I think FedEx has been criticized for this in some of the litigation, you know, perhaps rightly so. Uh, for using all sorts of euphemisms, but uh, that is, you know, avoiding saying that E word, employment or employee. So you don't have a, you don't have an employee file if you're being careful and you really believe that you have independent contractors, you have a, an independent contractor file. I mean, sometimes it's, it sounds kind of silly, but uh, sometimes names, uh, maybe always, uh, often, names matter. So have a um, a, a kind of uh, set of, of terms that you use that make sense and that are, that are consistently applied so that you don't end up uh, having egg on your face. A worker signs an agreement. It covers what he or she is expected to be doing for the business. But sometimes things change. How often should companies be reviewing or going through these independent contractor arrangements? Uh, that's another good question. Um, I think it, it presupposes that, uh, that the, there's a, a, a sort of a, a, a thought process and some care in the, in the terms, the, as you mentioned, the term, the so-called nomenclature, and in the contract itself at the get-go. But then, as you say, Becky, things change. So I would say once a year is a good time I don't, I don't think, I mean, I, I guess in some businesses it may change more rapidly than that. But I think uh, if you said every year we're going to look at what Mr. X is doing and is Mr. X working 10 hours a week, um, 100 hours a week, or, or what, or something in between, is Mr. X working for only us now or is Mr. X still working for a, B, and C, the other brand names in our, in our industry. I think some relatively easy things can be done. It doesn't have to be a major undertaking uh, and probably should be done because, as you say, things change and, and often uh, that's another place where companies get into trouble. Expert commentator Robert W. Wood, thanks as always for bringing us up to date. Thanks, Becky. My interview with Rob Wood concludes the August 2015 edition of the CPA Report. We look forward to bringing you up to date again next month with our September 2015 release.